Michigan has its biggest game coming up in the non-conference in perhaps 30 years, believe it or not, with number three Texas coming to town. But we're going to kind of go back and forth a little bit between what happened with the Wolverines, what we can expect against Texas, and we've got PFF's Josh Liskowitz here to help us out to do that here on this episode of Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday. We're back and doing it. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And we, we have this PFF connection. We, we've had this uh, crossover going back to 2021, used to be weekly. Uh, but this is the first time, weirdly, that we have had Josh Liskowitz, who is the PFF Senior Data Collection Analyst. He is a Michigan alum, thus he follows Michigan perhaps a little more closely than uh, some of the others we've had on. So excited to have you on, Josh. It's been a long time coming, man. Hey, excited to finally be on, man. Let's well, keep it but- going. The first, uh, the first thing that we obviously have to bring up is you were wrong on the internet last night. Um, Uh-oh. and I mean, everyone needs to be aware of this. Uh, at Zach Blackerby, who runs the, uh, locked up, he runs, runs our college channels, but he's also the host of locked on and Auburn asked, what's your Mount Rushmore of cereals? I correctly said, it's just cinnamon toast crunch four times. And you had all kinds of nonsense you were bringing into this, but I want, I, I told you I'd give you a small window. To defend your choices, so go for it. What it comes down to is, I like choices in my life, okay? There's only one thing in my life I don't like a choice, and that's my wife. I'll just have one. Thank you very much. But uh, I need at least two cereals, so give me Cocoa Puffs. There's a lot of derivatives off that. Um, You know, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup one is basically the same thing, but peanut butter, that would be there, but I think it's kind of an offshoot to the original, uh, the Cocoa Puffs. So give me Cocoa Puffs. Give me, give me cinnamon toast crunch, and I'm happy with both. I don't see any reason why we can't have both in our lives. Oh, because I, I'm on the autism spectrum, and uh, <laughs> I like, I, I find one thing and I go for it. I uh, also had really good. It's like weirdly, I've lost weight as on on what I've called the French toast diet, oh. and uh, and and I also at one point in time back about thirteen, fourteen years ago lost weight on a diet of cinnamon toast crunch and buttered toast. That was like all I ate for like three weeks and I lost like 15 pounds. So uh, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate it in a way that uh, others might not, but nonetheless, that no one cares about that except for us right now. Let's get into some actual football. Um, when you look at what Michigan was uh, against Fresno State, uh, and you started to kind of like look at, you know, grade things out, look at the numbers and everything like that, I know a lot of Michigan fans, there's a kind of a dichotomy. There's some that are like, this is terrible. This is, this was awful. You're never going to beat Ohio state this way. That happens every year for whatever reason. Uh, And then there's others that say we won the championship last year. So who cares? Everything we get this year is gravy. Um, What was your kind of take on what you saw on Saturday against Fresno state? Are are you sure the latter Michigan fan exists? (laughs) I think they, they it's, sure it's about what that? they I, I think that they want to believe that what they're saying, but deep down they're like this isn't gonna beat Ohio State, as if we haven't had that discussion week in, week out until the game every year. Well, I, I would say luckily they don't have Ohio State this week, but they do have Texas, so <laughs> we'll we'll see how that works out. But I I I don't think the sky's falling. Do do they have some things they need to figure out, obviously on the offensive side? Yeah clearly um and do they have time to figure that out probably not but it's not like past years where you could you couldn't make a mistake this early in the year i'm not saying everything's fine if they lose this game by two by 20 whatever obviously you know you want them to win but like it's gonna take some time and that's okay at this point they've they've got the the way the new system is they're afforded that time um, and I, I think if they were to pull this off, it's basically puts them right in the mix to be toward the top. So I, I think it's a hell of an opportunity. And uh, I, when you look at the other side of the ball, 
that we want to not focus on just because we're used to the defense killing it. Um, they're phenomenal. And you look at what Texas has faced the last two years, they haven't faced anything close to what Michigan has defensively. So I'm really, really curious to see how that pans out. Uh, definitely one of the one of the ones I think just about any analyst, regardless of personal bias, has had on their schedule this year. Well, let's start offensively uh, because obviously defensively, there's there's a lot of good. Even even the stuff that wasn't good ended up being good, like Will Johnson. Uh, but when it comes to op- the offense, let's start with Davis Warren. Uh, what did what did you see from him, and w- where where do you feel like he? maybe showed you some things and where do you feel like he can make the biggest improvements and from week one to week two? Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that despite only, I think he had four attempts the entire game that traveled over 10 yards and air yards, didn't complete a single one, unless you count the one that was completed to a defender. Um, he still graded okay. He had a 72.9 overall grade. He was relatively efficient. Obviously, there's nothing flashy at all there. Uh, but outside of being late and under throwing a deep ball, he really didn't make mistakes either. So I, I think that's something to build off of, especially when you consider that you've got the defense on the other side that's going to bail you out most of the time. Um, I, I think to me, the bigger question is, do we get more from the split at the QB position? Uh, is it going to be really just Warren kind of taking over, looking at slants, trying to find Colson Loveland. Uh, is that where we're going to be getting at? Or, um, you know, are we going to be more dynamic because we're going the other end? I, I don't think I saw enough bad from Warren to kind of take him out of that realm. And considering it's we're only in week two um, and it's such a big game, I'd be surprised if he's not the one leading the way again. Uh, obviously, he's got to find receivers. We we. Colston Loveland, you mentioned, and obviously they're going to move him all, all over the field like they did even in week one. It's going to be hard to defend him. Mm-hmm. But what was there, we saw a litany of receivers in this game, uh, whether it was uh, Tyler Morris, who didn't really have the big game, kind of uh, slowed up on what very well could have been a touchdown pass. Uh, I thought that was a really good throw by Warren personally. Uh, but you also saw Peyton O'Leary, Kendrick Bell, Samaj Morgan, um, really were the guys that we saw in this game. Did, did any stand out to you a, at all? I mean, it was kind of hard because it just kind of felt like it wasn't necessarily like they were doing a heck of a lot in the passing game other than go kind of horizontal. Yeah, and I think that's really part of the problem. Uh, everyone wants to say, well, they're not getting separation. Well, that's hard to do when the entire field is condensed to 10 yards and in. You're, you're simply not going to create separation when you're not using the entire field. Um, and I and I mean that vertically, not horizontally, because obviously, like you just like you just mentioned, it was really a horizontal game. So I, I feel like to be fair to them, I, I don't feel like that was a very good litmus test. We'll see if maybe because um, obviously they're going to keep it vanilla against Fresno versus Texas. Hopefully you see it open up a little bit more this week and we get a little bit better feel for them. I'd like to think they're generally more skilled with the exception of obviously losing Roman, Roman Wilson. Um, I, I think in general, they're probably better, but it's tough to say yes or no based off the Fresno game. Uh, let me see. I'm just trying to look at the time here. I think we'll, let's, let's talk a little bit more offense. I want to get to the offensive line in the run game mm-hmm. uh, before we move on to the defense, which obviously has a lot more good. Let's attack more of the bad. But let's do that here in just one moment. Before we do, passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers.
All right, we're still here with Josh Bluskowitz. He's going to go the distance with us the whole show. Uh, rare that we do that with a guest, but uh, considering uh, his uh, his Michigan bona fides, uh, really wanted to keep him on here for the whole thing. Uh, so let's continue talking about the offense. Uh, the Michigan offensive line was a new look. There was some alarming moments, I felt, uh, but kind of on further review, maybe it wasn't as bad as it seemed. But what what did you see from that Michigan offensive line? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is they're just not getting significant movement off the ball. Um, I, I don't think they're particularly awful, as a, a lot maybe wanted to come away thinking there was. Obviously, the third and one stop where uh, the center gets blown up, that's not good. Can't have that, obviously. But, uh, you know, really, that was one of his only truly bad plays. I didn't think the offensive line as a whole um, was all that bad. Uh, I, I think there are some other things that didn't work either. I mean, you, you rely on a guy like Max Bredesen to be one of your guys, and I thought he missed a, I thought he missed a bunch of blocks. He only had a, um, a run blocking grade of 55.9. That's well below average. And uh, for someone like him, especially with the scheme they run, that's extremely important. So I, I think in general, yeah, it wasn't pretty, but I don't think it's irredeemable. And I think it also, I don't think there's any question that it improved when they went more toward Mullings. I, I think that's a, that's a big deal right there. Uh, we'll see if they continue to try and feature Donovan Edwards in, in just a straight running back capacity, or if they hand the reins to Khalil Mullings like they should. That's, yeah, that's the interesting thing, because here's the thing with, that I look at with Donovan. Uh, they call him Big Play Don, obviously, for mm-hmm. Big Game Don, rather, for a reason. Uh, i got some stats on that for you. Go ahead. Uh, but uh, he, I asked Tony Alford earlier today about him being a rhythmic kind of player, and like, you know, he, he kind of acknowledged that, yeah, that is how he is, but we also, you know, we've got limited snaps to get all of these different guys in. Um, how, how much patience would you have with Donovan? Because... It does seem like in, in in games like these, these are the ones where you expect Donovan to have giant games. Uh, he's done it almost every time. Uh, maybe maybe overshadowed a little bit in uh, Alabama and uh, Ohio State last year because Blake Corum, you know, was Blake Corum. But you, you look at 2022 Penn State, you look at 2022 Ohio State, you look at the national championship game, you look at the... Uh, some of these Big Ten championship games he's been in. He's been phenomenal, but he kind of disappears in some of the... Games like what we just saw. So what are your thoughts on Donovan? So I heard Devin Gardner say something on his radio show a couple days ago that I thought was interesting. He talked about how he just felt everything needed to be blocked up perfectly for Edwards. And so I went back and I looked. The last two years, he has 28 runs that we would call explosive plays. Typically, they're 10 or plus more yards. He's made multiple missed tackles. They're his best plays. And out of those 28 explosive runs, only five involved forced missed tackles within five yards of the line of scrimmage. So that really speaks to what Devin was saying on the radio the other day, that really he needs to get ahead of steam going. And when you have this kind of offense with uh, an offensive line that's still gelling, um, just not conducive to that. Conversely, Khalil Mullings, obviously his sample size is much, much lower over the last two years. He only has six explosive plays total. Four of them involve forced missed tackles within five yards of the line of scrimmage. So I think that's a pretty telling stat. And I think just in general right now, it's clear as day to me that Mullings should be the feature back for them. Uh, Considering how much they want to work horizontally, apparently, I think that's where you get Edwards involved. Get him more and more involved in the passing game. I thought last year... They probably didn't do enough of that. And this year, I think out of absolute necessity, they really need to do that, especially if they're going to try and continue to give uh, just the easy passes for Davis Warren to throw. I agree with that, especially considering we saw a lot of that in 2022. Maybe not Mm -hmm. as much as you would hoped because he had had some injury issues after he went for that deep ball against Hawaii in week two. Uh, But uh, we've heard since he has arrived on campus, he might be the best receiver that they have as far as his hands. So this could be a game where you really get, get him involved. I'd love to see some of those. I would love to see some of those uh, formations like we saw against Penn State last year. 
where they have both him and Mullings in at the same time, because that opens up a lot of different opportunities because uh, especially if, if you do have Alex Orgy in there and then it just really, to me, it's what do you defend? Uh, obviously you, you're thinking run in a lot of ways, but the, the pass game is still on the table. So I'd love to see that. Let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, the defensive ends or the edge rushers, whatever you want to call them in this defense were lights out. You, they were the two guys that graded highest, if I'm not mistaken for Michigan in this game. Uh, what, what did you see from Josiah Stewart and Derek Moore? I mean, everyone's talking about Josiah. Derek Moore is right behind him there in the 90th percentile. Uh, what, 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 what did you like about those two guys in this game? What did I see from Josiah Stewart? Uh, I saw Hassan Reddick. That's what I saw. I saw a dynamic edge rusher who can also play in space off the ball, drop into coverage. I mean, he, he did everything. And when you take into account the hosses they have inside on that D line, um, more on the other side, obviously, and all the other pieces, man, there's just, there's just so much you can do with. Well, I mean, really, you could say it about just about any of them, but specifically with a guy like him, you can really exploit his versatility. And uh, I, I'm, he's might be the player I'm most excited to see for the rest of this season. I thought he was fantastic against Fresno, and I really do think the sky's the limit for him. I, I think he's an absolute stud. Um, one key stat for him is uh, his win rate. On pass rushes, 50% Wow! against Fresno. That is outrageous. Uh, more on the other side, his is 30%, which is the same as Hutch's was against Ohio State in, in that big game. So I've, it was a much bigger sample size for Hutch, uh, as, as you would expect. But that kind of tells you how absolutely dominant the two of them were that game. I, I want to bring in just kind of the idea here. Like, let's just mention Texas. We'll talk a little bit more about them in uh, the third segment here, but a lot of people went into this season saying that Texas probably has the best offensive line in the country. What, what kind of, but when you factor in all four of those front guys for Michigan, I'll even add in uh, some of those others like Ernest and, uh, J- and uh, Jay Sean Barham, who didn't necessarily grade out huge on your site, but I was just floored watching this guy in the games uh, in the game, rather one game, not multiple. Um, what, uh, what kind of challenge does Michigan have, but oh, conversely, what kind of challenge does Texas have to kind of go up against this front? Cause like you said, at the top of the show, Texas hasn't seen a defense like this yet in, in the Steve Star- Sarkeesian era here. Yeah, they really haven't. And, and I would agree that they're probably the top O line returning. I mean, we look at just what they did last week. They allowed pressure on two total dropbacks of, I think, like 35. Uh, and that's for both quarterbacks. So if you're only allowing pressure on two total dropbacks, you're probably going to do pretty well. Now, I will say the results of those two plays were a sack and an interception. So I'm not saying every time Michigan gets pressure on them, it's going to be a huge play for them. But that kind of shows you the importance of that. I don't think Michigan's only getting pressure on two plays this week. So we'll see how that pans out. But it's, there's certainly a case to be made that uh, it kind of goes both ways. This is probably the best O-line that uh, Michigan has faced in the last two years and not even close to the best, has to be the best defensive line Texas has faced. Um, one thing I will point out to that is Washington put two tackles into the into the NFL, and uh, that wasn't much of a problem for Michigan. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean that was considered the best offensive line that Michigan faced last year. They were the Joe Moore Award winners, and mm-hmm. Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, and you know the rest absolutely wrecked them. Let's continue talking about the defense, and then start to kind of preview Texas a little bit more. Let's do that here in just a moment. But before we do, you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we've got a little something different for you now through September 22nd. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Keep in mind, NFL starts tomorrow. You're going to want this. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and then you can cancel at any time. 
So just visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. All right, let's finish out with Josh Liskowitz uh, from PFF. He is the senior data analyst uh, over there at uh, PFF. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing just how, like, PFF has uh, kind of ruled the roost when it comes to going back and saying, did my eyes see what my eyes saw? And sometimes, you know, I think, like, there there's a little bit of a discrepancy. And the one player I want to discuss with that is, uh, Jay Sean Barham, who I don't think had the, the highest grade that, uh, or like necessarily an incredible grade, but me watching him from the sidelines, I was like, <laughs> the best way I put it is especially seeing him, uh, get loose against Mikey Keen. I, it was like, Oh, good for happy Gil. Oh my, I don't want to say, uh, take the Lord's name <laughs> in vain, but it was like that, right. It was that, like that moment with Shooter McGavin and, uh, Jaws, uh, from, uh, the Bond movies. Uh, but, um, what did you see from Jay Sean Barham? They, they see him internally as being maybe the best linebacker that's come through, uh, Ann Arbor. And I mean, he comes at you like a freight train. Uh, but certainly there, there were some reasons why I think he got dinged a little bit. I just, am curious as to what you saw from him. Yeah. And I actually had the, uh, live analysis on that game too. So I can not only just as a senior analyst re- reviewing games, I actually, had the first crack at it. So yeah, I was a little bit disappointed in his play. Um, I, the movement skills are ridiculous. He, he looks like a corner at times, the way he moves, the way he can bend, uh, is just a phenomenal athlete. There's no denying that, but I thought at times he was a little bit of a dog chasing cars. Yeah. He's jumping out of gap a little too much. Um, I, I thought he was freelanced a bit and frankly, this, Defense is going to allow him to do that just because of the studs they have up front. And he's going to make a lot of big plays as a result of it too. But um, I I thought there was just a little bit too much out of his responsibility. And considering uh, a couple of the hosses up front and in the middle, some of his defensive tackles who are probably going to be top 20 picks really didn't have their best games either. That doesn't always bode well for him. So I think it's probably a little bit of both there, but yeah, I, I didn't think he was he was as fundamentally sound as I had hoped to, to see. Well, hopefully that gets cleaned up. Uh, certainly, it's it's a it's a work in progress in game one, especially you're trying to figure out what you have before Texas comes to town. Like I said, the the biggest non conference game, and I think 30 years in terms of uh, rank on rank matchup. Um, let's talk about the back end before we we close out and discuss the actual matchup on Saturday. What I thought it was Will Johnson's maybe worst game uh, of his career until it wasn't really. Um, the, obviously, the pick six loomed large. Um, mm-hmm. What did you see from him? And and but he Jair Hill graded out kind of similarly. Uh, what did you What did you like? What did you not like about the cornerback play? Yeah, I've, it, I thought um, in his post game presser, Fresno's coach kind of gave some good points on them just trying to keep him off balance. They did some double moves. Uh, you know, they did, they threw a bunch of different things at him. And, and I think that, uh, that gave him some issue. I, I don't, it was weird the rotation that they had, right? So I don't know if, you know, maybe it was a little bit of rhythm coming in and out. Then all of a sudden they're coming right at him. If maybe that was an issue, I don't know. I don't want to give him excuses there. I think he just had a generally off day, except for that one play. Um, it is worth pointing out though, that, uh, he did have our highest grade on the team against the run. He had a 79.5 run defense grade. So, you know, it's that's one of the contributions that often goes unnoticed specifically at cornerback, but that's a big deal too. And that's part of his grade still being okay uh, despite giving up a, a couple of big plays and getting lucky not getting giving up that one big play. Uh, what about Jair Hill? What did you see from him? Yeah, I thought he was fine. Generally keeping everything in front. Obviously, he gave up a uh, gave up a couple, but um, I I didn't think there was anything uh, too too crazy. Definitely nothing I, I'd be worried about going forward. We'll see against Texas. I'm not sure what to think of Texas's weapons outside of Bond, just because it's just a wholesale rotation from last year. So, you know, as experienced as yours is now, I don't know how much of a litmus test that is going to be for them. I think 
USC is going to be a much tougher one when that comes up. But um, I had nothing, nothing from him uh, to, to give me too much pause. All right, so with that in mind, let's look forward to Texas. I, I, I feel like the narrative kind of coming out of week one is Texas amazing, Michigan bad. Mm-hmm. Um, what a- analyzing what these two teams showed against the you know the teams that they played against? I, I think Fresno State's probably uh, a a lot better than Colorado State. We've seen yeah. Colorado State come through in, in the past. It, the result was similar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I do think that you know we've seen Fresno State over the years just kind of challenge anyone that kind of gets in their way. Uh, that's just kind of who they are, but. Do you feel like this is a Herculean task for Michigan, or do you feel like this is a lot more even and that maybe Michigan, like, it's hard to tell if Michigan's had a big drop-off, especially offensively, defensively, maybe not. But what, what is, how do you evaluate uh, in preview of this game against Texas? Yeah, so one of my responsibilities as a senior analyst is I review all, a lot of the uh, run plays and make sure just give a second set of eyes after the fact during the week after the games. And uh, one of the first games I did happened to be Texas, Colorado state. And for whatever reason, when I started on the Texas offensive side, I started in the fourth quarter and they are just absolutely manhandling guys all over the field. And I thought, Oh man, I, I know it's Colorado state, but this is above and beyond, you know, the, the level of physicality that you would expect to see. Now, knowing obviously it's fourth quarter, that game's out of hand. Those are reserves. Let's see what the rest of the game looks like. And I thought Colorado State was fine against them in the run. I didn't think they were truly outmanned when they were responsible to their gaps. They did generally fine. I didn't think they were overpowering there. Obviously, we talked about pass pro earlier, how uh, Texas allowed two total reps with pressures. That's obviously notable. But, you know, again, they haven't seen this. I just, I don't know what to expect on that side. And I will see. Maybe Isaiah Bond just rips up Michigan. I don't know. Michigan saw a lot of pretty good wide receivers last year. and that didn't Including really Isaiah Bond. Yeah, that's true. That's a very good point. They saw him last year already. So they've already scouted him and played against him. So, yeah, I... I don't know. I, I'm not saying Michigan is just going to whoop up on them, but I, I do think that it, it's going to be a bit of a reckoning for that offense. I just don't think they've seen an animal like this. Now, what Texas's defense versus Michigan's offense is going to look like, don't have much of a clue there. I didn't think Texas' defense was that great last year outside of the two defensive interiors they put in the NFL. And as I just said, they put them in the NFL. They're gone. So don't know how much we're getting out of the rest of it. One thing I will say uh, from a interesting advanced statistical standpoint, um, they had just uh, one forced incompletion returning from a linebacker f- from last year. So when we talked about, you know, getting Colson Loveland going, getting Donovan going, I, I think that's the way to do it. I think you've you've got to get those mismatches against linebackers, obviously size against the safety for Colson Loveland. I, I think that's where you win that game is, is you attack that linebacker level. Well, I am excited to, to see it. 12-10 kickoff on Saturday on Fox, both Big Noon and, uh, and College Game Day are going to be there. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to cover even the pregame with that because there's just so much going on. Biggest game of the season, obviously to this point, could be of the year. But that is Josh Liskowitz over at PFF. Like I said, he is your uh, senior data collection analyst. You can follow him uh, on Twitter. You can see where, uh, if you're watching, tell tell me your Twitter now because I'm going to have a Chiron on. I didn't memorize it. It's PFF Josh, right? PFF underscore Josh. You got it. Okay. Uh, I just realized, like, I'm always, I, I never usually have to say, like, oh, yeah, you can follow him there or whatever. My video, it will, actually, I forgot. I'm recording it in two places. My video is stopped on one place. It's still going here, but that's a good time to say sayonara. So thank you, Josh, for joining us. Thank you, uh, everyone, for watching and or listening. We will talk to you again on Thursday. Peace. <laughs>